Now we're joined by our special guest, Alistair Campbell, who's just released volume five of his diaries. I haven't read all of it. Look at the bloody size of it. It's big. My first question it's is, right, talk. Alistair, you're a grown man. Mm -hmm. uh, who writes a diary? This is like, well, you're a 12-year-old girl. <laughs> Do you have a little heart lock on the side of it? I mean, you can't stop publishing diaries. It's ridiculous. Well, if you feel like that, why did you get me on the programme? Uh, to ask you about other stuff. OK, fine. Um, well, I'll bring it back to the diaries. Every no, time. yeah, look, we, we, have, we have looked through the diaries. It's interesting stuff in here. Um, a lot of it is about the era at which the Blair-Brown rivalry was reaching, like, its absolute apex, right? And there's an interesting story in there where Alex Ferguson, another dour, unpleasant Scotsman, <laughs> is saying that you should get rid of your dour, unpleasant Scotsman <laughs> because, he's, be, because he's, getting in, he's getting in the way. And I do sort of look at the situation of the Labour Party here and now, and I think you can trace it back there, you know. If, if you and, and Tony Blair had had the balls to knife Gordon, just like the Tories would have done in the same situation, mm. then Labour might not be where they are now. That was definitely the, the, sen the question that goes through pretty much every page, because he thought about it a lot. And the point you made, what Alex actually said was that Gordon was like his brown kid. Yeah. Remember his number two mm. that eventually he felt was maybe thinking he was a number one. But the, the difference in politics and sport is that in politics, they stay on the pitch. They don't, you know, Tony could have asked Gordon to leave, but he wouldn't have disappeared. He'd still have been a big political figure. And he was, I mean, the, the truth is that Gordon, for all the faults and, you know, they're all in there, mm. uh, he also was a formidable talent. Um, uh, let's this talk is when you do your funny bit, isn't it? No. OK, all right. Quite the reverse. We're oh. going to talk about the Chilcot Inquiry, which is only slightly longer than this diary. Mm. Um, although I did hear they were at one point thinking of using the same picture <laughs> on the front. Uh, now, you, uh, you know, by all accounts, you, you got off well out of Chilcot. There was a lot of people who wanted you and Tony and the other people around you to come out as looking dodgy or bent. And actually, what you come out looking like is a bit gullible because there was just dodgy intelligence that you all fell for, right? Well, I mean, it's very difficult, I think, if you're him, the Prime Minister, or me working for the Prime Minister, and that's what the intelligence is saying. It's quite difficult, because I, mean, I think the Prime Minister does trust his intelligence services. I think if you take any big, big decision that, a, that an elected democratic leader takes, and you, you subject to the sort of scrutiny that that decision has now had... Uh, you look what's going on in Syria now. Uh, I mean, I don't know if we're allowed to talk about Syria and... Go, uh, go for it. Vladimir Putin, happy birthday, Vladimir. Uh, but the reality is there are consequences of action in Iraq. There have been consequences of inaction as well. Syria is a catastrophe, absolute catastrophe. Mm. And you could argue, you talk about learning lessons for Labour in this period, I think one of the big lessons that's been learned about Iraq is actually that it, they're scared of doing the really, really, really difficult things. Um, Blair hinted to Esquire this month he might return to British politics. Could he? I think he quite said that. I, read, I, I saw the headlines this morning, so I read it. I did that old-fashioned journalistic thing of, you know, finding out what the facts were. Do oh, you, really? You Better than one? you did with that intelligence, then? Well, no, because that uh, was checked. Lesson learned. Nice cheap shot. Due but... diligence. <laughs> anyway, have you read the Roots article? No. What he basically says is that there is now a big debate to be had in British politics mm. about the role of the centre ground. So you've got this sort of right-wing hard Brexit thing on this side, and you've got the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn, you know, clearly moving fairly substantially to the left, and then you've got a lot of people who are feeling a bit politically homeless who think that their politics is in the centre ground. So I think that's what he was yeah. saying, is that that debate has got to be had. Um, <clears throat> was that OK? That was good. What happened after question time with John McDonnell? Did he call you a fucking arsehole? Um, I believe he did. I believe he did. Did it nearly come to a Mike Hookham, Stephen Wolfe situation? <laughs> no, no. I think we were... No, I th what, I'll tell you exactly what happened. We had had an agreement, the two of us, before question time. Let's not get personal, OK? Because mm. it's pointless. In fact, it was he who had made that approach. I was actually, if you, if you, if you look at the programme, I was actually in a, for me, incredibly conciliatory... I was actually talking about mistakes we'd yeah. made yeah. as New Labour. And then he suddenly sort of pops out, oh, my God, this is nauseating. And I thought, what is he on about? And the truth is, I don't think he can hold himself back. I'm afraid there is an element of the Labour Party, and I think John McDonnell is part of it, they hate us, the Blairites, more than they hate the Tories. And 
I think he just couldn't resist having that. So I said to him as we came to the palace, you just can't help yourself. There's me trying to actually sort of, you know, hold things together, not get divisive, and you can't help yourself. So it got a bit, it got a bit, <clears throat> to be fair to him, I think I swore at him before he swore at me. 